Today, uh, Mel and I are in Sydney with Jason Costa. He's a risk engineer with RiskCon Engineering and the president of the Australasian Institute of Dangerous Goods Consultants. Jason has been kind enough to meet with us ahead of the annual AIDGC conference and workshop here in Sydney, which will have happened once this episode has been released. Jason, can you tell us a little bit about your career and how you ended up in DG Consulting and eventually becoming the president of the AIDGC? Yeah, absolutely. Then thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Um, so I'm about six years into my career now, so about six years with RiskCon Engineering. Um, I joined this company straight out of university and was lucky enough to get a fantastic role that I've loved ever since. Um, I see probably no reason I'll ever leave. I, I love what I do as a DG consultant and a risk engineer. Um, and yeah, so the directors of the company at RiskCon were previously involved with the AIDUC quite heavily and obviously encouraged me as I developed my career to get as involved. Um, the AIDUC is a fantastic resource for our industry. So the earlier I could get involved, the better. I think I was two or three years out of uni when I first joined the AIDUC. So I was trying to work out when I actually did the exam. <laughs> it was somewhere around that time. Yeah. So there's an yes. exam required? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, about three years, I think. After three years worth of experience, then to transition from an associate member of the AIDUC, which is for anybody, and okay. I'll touch on that more later, to a full consulting member with qualifications and experience as a consultant. Uh, there's an assessment process which is you know, governed by the board of the AIDGC um, to just ensure that everyone's meeting mm -hmm. the requirements to provide uh, appropriate services and consulting knowledge, basically. Right. Yep. And so what was your degree? Yeah, so I studied chemical engineering and project management at university, yep. a double degree at University of Sydney. Yeah, cool. Yep. And I guess what is it that you love about the core of what you're, what you're doing as a consultant? Yeah, I think I, I say this all the time that the absolute favorite part of my job is the variability. So lots of chemical engineers, including myself, going through uni, imagine themselves ending up as a process engineer, like working on a plant, the same plant, the same process day in, day out, um, which at the time I thought that was what I was going to end up doing. And like I said, I was lucky enough to land a role in consulting, which I didn't know existed, mm. um, but found very quickly that it is exactly for me being able to go on one site for a short period of time, get involved with the project, um, see it through to the end, and then transition to a completely new project or completely new process at a different company yep. is fantastic. It awesome. suits my personality and it suits yeah what I want to get out of my career. Yeah, great. And this may be doubling up a little bit, but yep. can you tell us a bit more about the day-to-day -day of what a dangerous goods consultant does yep. and who or what organisations sh should consider consulting? With it. Absolutely. So dangerous goods, as you guys have explained on the podcast previously, cover most chemicals used in industry. So the clients that we would consult to could be anyone that is storing or handling any form of chemical, essentially. So covering any class of dangerous goods. Um, the day-to-day -day would generally be us or one of my team getting a call saying, hey, I've got these chemicals. What do I do with them? How do I store them safely? How do I store them in a compliant manner? Um, you know, sufficient to the requirements of local standards, regulations. Um, that's, I guess, the crux of being a DG consultant. And then, yeah, there's other aspects of risk engineering as well, obviously. Yep. Awesome. Great. And what sort of organisations would you support? Um, support as a consultant? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so it can range, like I said, from any industry, but also small, large scale. So we do work for defence, pharmaceutical, food and beverage industries. Um, warehousing is up mm -hmm. and coming a lot in Sydney these days. Um, and like I said, any sort of scale from you know, small family-owned businesses up to full-blown multi-international, uh, multi-million international companies, mm -hmm. where you know they might be doing a project to implement a new process at their plant and bring on someone like us to consult in you know that kind of service. That's great. So, what is the AIDGC's purpose, and who does it support and provide service for? Yep. So the AIDUC is an independent industry body and the purpose, I guess, is to provide resources and information to the hazardous chemical industry. And that could be anyone across Australia. Um, the purpose of providing in accessibility to consultants is also a key part of the AIDUC. It's not just for consultants themselves, but it's for the clients of those consultants. Yeah, so sure. if you're a company that is storing or handling dangerous goods, you can go on the AIDGC's website and there's a find a consultant feature, which will allow you to locate local consultants in your state or your local area and determine their area of expertise by 
dangerous goods class. The AIDGC provides a directory and access to more than 60 professionally qualified consultants. Can you tell us a bit about this directory? Who are these people and what criteria they have to meet to become listed? Yeah, no, definitely. So the uh, directory includes our consulting members as opposed to our associate members. And anybody can be an associate member of the AIDGC, whether you just have an interest in hazardous chemical storage at all, whereas the consulting members are assessed and go through a formal process to demonstrate a sufficient level of experience and understanding in the field of DG consulting. Um, and the directory itself you know, specifies by state, by a DG class. Um, some of our consultants will specialize in particular classes. For example, you know, class three flammable liquids, we might have a consultant that works solely with underground fuel tanks. Mm -hmm. So anyone that's interested or anyone that needs consulting services for something specific like that would be able to identify the consultant that most suits their needs through that directory. That's yeah. great. And as you said before, the, the criteria they have to meet is fairly rigorous. Absolutely. There's a bit of an assessment, like an exam style process um, that is governed by the board of the AIDGC, who are all obviously consulting members. Um, we make sure that our consultants that are going through that assessment process have sufficient experience and knowledge, particularly of the relevant Australian standards for each class. So being obviously AS 1940 is, applies to class three. So a consultant going through the assessment process for class three competency would be expected to have a very high level of understanding of AS 1940, for example. Yeah. Um, what are some of the topics that are being discussed at the conference this week? Yeah, so this year's conference is a fairly uh, broad one. We decided not to go down a, any specific avenue, given that the most well-received events that we've the ARDGC has been running over the last year are the ones that cover a wide variety of topics. Mm. So this week's conference covers things like hydrogen, uh, lithium-ion batteries, general standards and regulatory updates from SafeWork New South Wales, the regulator in this state, um, as well as a yeah, range of other sort of interesting topics related to the field. And we found that, like I said, that is more well received than uh, specific conference topics that cover uh, only a certain event uh, or a certain niche, I guess. E even those are extremely valuable. The general audience is more amenable to you know, as many topics as they possibly can. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's great. And then they can come to one place and get a vast range of information on the one day rather e than having to come back multiple times. Exactly right. And meet a wide range of people that cover such a you yeah. know, broad variety of topics as well. Yeah. yeah. So how does that work? Is there networking opportunities there? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So throughout the day, we'll have networking opportunities between the presentations as well as, you know, drinks and a networking event after the end of the day, the end of the conference day. That's great. So who exactly would you recommend this, like, this conference for? Who, who's it? Yeah, tailored yeah. Too. Tailored to. Yeah, no, like I said, so associate members of the AIDGC could be anybody at all. And for that reason, I would encourage anyone that has a vested interest in the storage and handling of hazardous chemicals to get involved with the AIDGC, come along to our events. And you, yeah, like I said, you'll meet people, the networking opportunities are endless. Um, and the information that we present in the AIDGC conference and other events is extremely valuable. Mm. Um, and then obviously consultants themselves, anyone that is a consultant, either come along to the events and gain some, some knowledge or meet other consultants in the field and, and consider becoming a consulting member. Yep. In terms of those associate members, what sort of variety of job titles might you expect to be in the crowd? Yeah, no. So we can see anything from you know, work health and safety officers, like your local safety expert or hazardous chemicals officer at a facility that is you know, manufacturing or warehousing, storing hazardous chemicals. You generally companies like that will have an in-house chemical expert, mm -hmm. so to say, um, that will be the one to go to with all those questions. So for people like that, the AIDGC conference and other events are very, very informative. Mm -hmm. It allows them to convey information that we present back to their um, their companies. Yeah. Good. I guess my favourite part of the day is also seeing and hearing about case studies and what sort of, you know, what's happening out there, recent incidents. Um, yeah, do you have any, is any spring to mind uh, recently that have happened that we can learn from? In terms of incidents? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So there was a recent one in Victoria that I think many of your listeners, listeners probably are aware of, the massive warehouse fire down in uh, Derriment yeah, in Melbourne. Absolutely. Yeah, it was awful. And for the particular reason being that that facility had had an incident within the last 12 months already. So, and that the previous incident also resulted in a fatality. Oh, mm. wow. So that facility in particular should have been and was subject to far more scrutiny by regulators and Victorian EPA and the relevant authorities 
however, it still ended up having another scenario happen, mm -hmm. another incident. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I think that's definitely a key one to learn from. Something has gone wrong mm -hmm. and yep. we need to take that on board and make sure it doesn't happen again. Yeah, I think and the impacts are fairly obvious in both of those incidents. First of all, the, the fatality is an obvious impact, but and again, the wide-reaching environmental impact of that one was obvious for all of the people living in nearby, yeah, nearby. nearby communities. Absolutely, especially. absolutely right. The toxic smoke alone is obviously the key concern when a fire is occurring, but on top of that, the uh, FRV, so Fire and Rescue Victoria, applied, I read somewhere, over 8, 9 million litres of water to that fire. Wow. Wow. That water is being contaminated by a chemical storage and that water has to go somewhere. Yep. So it's very likely being running, run off into the local environment, um, local waterways. So the fines and the impact to the environment are going to be very significant. Yeah. Wow. And you mentioned emergency service workers. How are they impacted by incidents like this? Yeah, definitely. So the emergency service workers are obviously as trained as they possibly can be for hazardous chemical related incidents, um, particularly, you know, some uh, fire authorities will have dedicated hazmat teams. Mm. Okay. Um, where they are trained specifically to respond to the hazards presented by toxic smoke and potentially contaminated water and things like that. Um, in this case, I think the fire and rescue response was very rapid. Again, I hope that was not due to the virtue that that facility yeah. was had pre uh, concerns previously. But in this case, they were able to extinguish the fire as quickly as feasible. Mm. But in saying that, due to the massive storage of chemicals, it I think it blazed for more than 24 hours, so wow. yeah, still substantial. With those first responders as well, when they're trying to, I guess, come up with the best practices to respond to incidents involving emerging hazards, emerging risks, for, for instance, process a lithium ion battery, well. yeah. Do they engage with organisations like ARDGC? Absolutely, yeah. The lithium ion batteries is a great point. So that is a very recent topic that's you know, obviously getting more and more traction as we see on the news more and more. Um, fire scenarios occurring, particularly with e-bikes and e-scooters in apartments, in people's garages at home. Um, the risk there is very substantial. And like you said, fire response services or emergency services, including fire response, are the front line to events such as that. So they need to be aware of the risks associated. An e-scooter is posing very different risks to a regular scooter, obviously. Yep. Um, in saying that, we're still struggling to work out the best way to approach lithium ion battery fires. Mm. Um, applying water through either fire hydrants or um, even your local hose. You see videos of people just chucking their hose on it. Yeah, It's not found to be very effective at all. Um, that's due to the nature of the chemistry of the batteries. So we're trying to find other solutions and mitigations to prevent you know, these dramatic fires from occurring so regularly. And it's, it's a topic I think we're all still kind of learning a bit about and often a hot topic at the conference too. Exactly right, yeah, which is the reason that this year's ARDGC workshop is focusing solely on lithium-ion batteries. Mm -hmm. So it's, and we did previously as well. Yep. Um, even, you know, it was coming about as, like you said, a hot topic uh, two, three years ago maybe is when we started to really focus on the risks associated mm -hmm. um, and we're still talking about it now. So those problems are not fully solved. We need to make sure that they're being responded to by emergency services appropriately and the design for storage solutions is also appropriate for the risk. Yep. Is there anything people should be aware of in terms of changing laws or regulations? Yeah, definitely. So Australian standards are updated fairly regularly or as required um, and local regulations are similarly maintained to kept, keep up with uh, other states in particular where the reg regulations can vary. Um, and the ARDGC is a fantastic resource to keep on top of that. So we'll obviously publish any news related to updated standards or changes to regulation. And yeah, it's obviously very relevant in the industry because you want to make sure that your facility is compliant with the most current regulation, not one from uh, a superseded one from the past. Is there a particular topic that you're aware of that's being focused on at the moment that you expect to see some changes soon? Um, definitely, like we touched on lithium ion batteries. Yep. I'm hoping that in the very near future, the class nine standard for miscellaneous dangerous goods, including lithium ion batteries is reviewed because that one is overdue for a review. Mm -hmm. Um, and obviously the technology has developed so much in the last five, 10 years, and that standard is over 20 years old. So it requires, it needs to be brought up to date with um, like keeping in mind the risks associated with lithium ion batteries. Yeah. yeah. And, and who's involved in that process, updating standards and regulations? Yeah, so each standard has generally a committee associated with it that's in charge of or uh, works with Standards Australia to 
update and review and amend standards. And the people that are members of that committee will be local experts, such as members of the ARDGC. So lots of our consulting members are on standards committees for standards in which they are most experienced in. Um, so they'll contribute in you know regular meetings, regular discussions and regular reviews of a certain standard or multiple standards. Um, I personally am in, on two stand, different standards committees for standards that we use regularly. Um, and like I said, it's a bit of a process going back and forward with mm. other experts and Standards Australia to make sure that the relevant changes are incorporated. <laughs> then each standard, before it's published, goes for public comment where anyone can make suggestions, um, recommend changes or you know, identify ways in which the standard could be improved. Okay. Yeah, great. Do you think there's a need for, or would you like to see more uh, people entering the dangerous goods consultant career? And if so, how, how, what is the pathway to get there? Absolutely. Yeah, I would love to see more and more dangerous goods consultants. In my opinion, the more DG consultants there are, the less incidents we would have related to DG storage. Mm. Um, ideally, if every single PCBU, so every operator or handler of dangerous goods, engaged a dangerous goods consultant to help them with design or projects, then uh, a qualified AIDGC consultant, then we'd be able to minimize the risk and potentially avoid fatalities, injuries, or damage to equipment. Um, in terms of the way to go about it, most of our consultants have an engineering background, background but that's not absolutely necessary. Um, depending on your level of experience and involvement in various projects, there is potential for almost anyone to become a consultant, usually under the right guidance. So myself, for example, I, like I said, was encouraged to join the ARDGC and become a consulting member through the directors of my company who were more senior and more experienced. They pass their knowledge on to me and then I use that to become a consulting member. So under the right guidance, I think anyone could become a consultant. Yeah, great. Okay, and is there sort of like an internship type program available or are you just on the job like partner with someone that's more experienced? Yeah, there's not a formal internship process, but the AIDUC does have a student membership option, which I would definitely encourage. It's a very cheap, easy option for uni students that particularly chemical engineers that are interested in the field and want to learn more about uh, local incidents, changes to standards of regulations and how that might impact their future careers as engineers. Um, that would probably be my biggest suggestion to younger engineers looking to get into the field. Yep. Good. Awesome. Uh, what other events does the IODGC have on the calendar? Yeah, so for this year, we've obviously got the workshop and the conference coming up. Um, later in October, we're running a HASCHEM seminar in conjunction with Workplace Health and Safety Queensland um, up in Brisbane. I think that's in late October. And then we'll have a similar list of events all throughout next year. So we try and do at least one or two in most major cities. Yeah, great. That's great. So if anyone misses the conference this year, is uh, can they catch up on the content anyway? Absolutely. I'd encourage anyone to reach out to the AIDGC and get in touch. We can always provide the slides um, and we're looking in the future to enable uh, online or virtual attendance to the conference and events as well, just to sort of facilitate accessibility across the country. Yeah, we're really looking forward to uh, attending the workshop and the conference uh, later this week. Obviously, when this podcast comes out, the events will have just happened, but... Uh, Hopefully it gives you some inspiration to sign up to the ARDGC and get to some events in the future. Um, Absolutely, get involved. Yeah, Definitely, and thank you both very much for having me. Thank you very much for coming on, Jason. Yeah, we really no appreciate it. No problem at all. No see you Thank again. you. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers.